Professor Shabir Mahdi. He's Dean at the Health School of Health Sciences at Wits University and a Professor of Vaccinology. Professor Mahdi, I do appreciate the time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't know if there's a scientific reason for this, but gee, this wave seems to be moving across Gauteng much more quickly than the previous waves. Just a week or so ago, 10 days ago, we were looking at new case numbers in the hundreds. Now we're looking at over 8,000 across the country. Yeah, good afternoon, Stephen. Thanks for having me. So I think what you're describing is correct in so far as uh, the upward trajectory of this wave is in fact much faster than what we experienced even with the Delta variant, which was two times more transmissible than our original virus has circulated. Uh, so that does suggest to us that this particular resurgence is taking place due to a virus that is a variant that is very likely more transmissible than even the Delta variant. Uh, but at the same time, I think the other contributing factor might well be uh, that we obviously have uh, pretty much uh, really stopped most of our restrictions. So that coupled with the evolution of this variant uh, combined probably lends itself to much rapid, more rapid spread of the virus and people have become complacent with a number of measures. But that on its own is not too much of a concern to me. I think rather than looking at numbers each day and those numbers are going to continue rising in the thousands each day, the more important metric to be looking at is hospitalization. And when we come in looking at hospitalization right now, in fact, the rate of increase in hospitalization compared to with the previous waves in Gauteng uh, is not any different. And in fact, probably slightly lower. And so I would just guard against making too much about thousands of cases being reported. Uh, rather keep your eye on hospitalization and death. So in other words, what's happening in Europe and places with high levels of vaccination happening in parts of the United States as well, could well also be happening here to an extent. We have very high case numbers. That doesn't mean that we're going to lose as many people as we did, say, in the third wave. We're going to have a slightly different experience or maybe a very different experience. Uh, absolutely. In the United Kingdom, they're reporting up to 50,000 cases per day, uh, but their hospitalization rate is nominal. And the more testing you do, the more cases you're going to try to try. Uh, so if we were doing as much testing as the United Kingdom, as an example, we do 13 times less testing than the United Kingdom. So you probably should multiply our numbers by 13 uh, to get the true reflection of the number of cases that are transpiring here compared with what is transpiring in the United Kingdom. Uh, but as you correctly stated, in the United Kingdom, the vaccines certainly have played a major role in unhinging this hospitalization rate and the case rate in the community. In South Africa, it's going to be partly vaccines, but in fact, a big driver as to why we're not seeing that many cases of hospitalization uh, right now is not even vaccines. It's really because of the high force of infection that's transpired across the country during the course of the first three waves. We're currently concluding uh, what we call a zero survey in Gauteng, where we test for antibodies, and this is mapped down to a sub-district level. And then what, this, what the results show is that 72% of individuals in Gauteng actually have got a zero positive uh, which means that they've been previously exposed to the virus, essentially. And that previous exposure to the virus actually induces very potent what we call T-cell immunity, which works not too well in protecting against infection, but works extremely well when it comes against protecting, uh, when it comes to protecting against severe disease and death. So that high force of infection that's transpired will place us in some stable footing that this wave will be less severe than what we experienced in the past, at least when it comes to hospitalization and death. And that's despite the fact that there's the new variant, Omicron. It means that the immunity that we have, both from vaccines and from previous exposure to the virus, is actually going to hold. It is going to protect us to quite a large extent. Uh, correct. So much of the mutations that have occurred are going to be able to evade the antibody responses that's induced by past infection as well as vaccines. And those antibodies are especially important when it comes to protecting against infection and mild COVID. But when it comes to protecting against severe, severe disease, that is more mediated by what we call a T-cell immunity. And the mutations that have occurred leaves those T-cell uh, immune responses relatively unaffected, or only a small component of it. It's not just a single T-cell response we're looking at. We're looking at uh, T-cell responses to about 87 different targets of, as an example, the AstraZeneca vaccine. For natural infection, it would be more than 100 different targets when you, that are eliciting these T-cell responses. And these mutations that are occurring are not uh, knocking out most of those T cell responses. So the presence of the T cell responses that is induced both by vaccines as well as past infections is really what probably explains why the increase in hospitalization is not going in parallel to the increase in community, by community cases, uh, and probably lagging behind as well by two to three weeks. But at the same time, in addition to that lag that we expect, 
again, I'm fairly optimistic that uh, we're not going to see that large number of hospitalizations and deaths compared to what we have observed in the past. That doesn't mean that we're not going to see a substantial number of hospitalization and death, especially in unvaccinated individuals. So people who aren't vaccinated, and we understand that the queues are beginning to form at vaccination centers, if you've had the disease, if you are now worried about getting it now, it's still a good moment to get vaccinated, even if you've had it? If you've had the disease, uh, certainly you should even more the reason to get at least a single dose of the vaccine, because that really shoots your antibody responses right up. And you can actually overcome some of the resistance that the virus might have to the antibodies by really having high antibodies. So if you've, had, if you've been previously infected, you probably protect against severe disease, but if you want to enhance your protection against infection and mild COVID, then you certainly should be getting a single dose of the vaccine. And the same goes for people with high risk conditions. Uh, they need to be offered that booster dose of vaccine. And at the end of the day, South Africa needs to get the wake up call. A single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is not complete vaccination. Two doses of vaccine is probably close to complete vaccination and comparable to the other vaccines. Any adult that has received a single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine should immediately be offered the second dose of the Johnson & Johnson or a Pfizer vaccine because they've got suboptimal protection against severe disease compared to getting two doses of any other vaccine. For a Delta variant, the same would apply for Omicron variant. Professor Shabir Mahdi, as always, really appreciate the time. Thank you, Dean at the School of Health Sciences at Wits University. Professor, as you can hear, of vaccinology in a moment.